I think when you find one that's good, and I'm talking about somebody who's, by what does good mean? Good means that they communicate well so that your tenant isn't sitting around waiting for somebody who doesn't show up. They have a wide range of skills. They have their eyes open. So when they're there fixing one thing, if there are other things that need fixing, they notice them and have the skills to do them and also communicate to you that, oh, you know, I noticed this and I noticed this. Would you like me to fix them? Welcome to the Get Traction Podcast. If you are ready to learn exactly what it takes to become a real estate entrepreneur, this is the show for you. With your host, founder of Traction Real Estate Mentors and president of the Traction Real Estate Investors Association, Tom Zeeb. Welcome back to the Get Traction Podcast. It's Tom Zeeb. Happy to have you guys all here. I've got a very special guest again today. And uh, I want to talk about rentals. We haven't talked about rental properties in a while. And so I thought about who's a fantastic landlord with a lot of properties and a lot of years of experience that could share some fantastic knowledge about that side of the business, being a property owner and being a landlord. So today we're going to talk with none other than Jane Garvey from Chicago, Illinois, who's uh, been in the business for a long time. I'll have her tell you all about that and has had to fight the various fights legislatively and different battles coming up and dealing with tenants and all the things that landlords have to do so that you can get the benefits of uh, wealth appreciation from owning the properties and the cash flow over time. So Jane, welcome to the program. Hi, Tom. It's really great to be here. As you said, I've been in the business a long time. I bought my first rental property way, way, way back in 1979. So long time and have survived through numerous Market shifts of various kinds have survived through times where we had almost no data available because there weren't an, even any personal computers at that point in time. We might note much less any records online, but it has been a extremely interesting career. Rental properties has been part of my career. I've been in doing rentals as well as purchasing and rehabs of a variety of different property types as well. Everything from raw land to small commercial to, but mostly single family homes or townhouses or condos in terms of the rental portfolio. It's been interesting. Dealing with tenants is something that you need to get good at or you can't survive as a landlord unless you're willing to hire property managers, which I would highly recommend if you can find a good one. You're going to deal with contractors in much the same way that you do in rehabbing houses for some of your rental property, but you're also going to deal with a lot more handymen than the people that are into buy, rehab, resell would do. And you're going to deal with other workers. It's it's interesting and highly recommend for everybody at least to some level as a way to supplement whatever else it is you're doing with life until you get to the point with it that you can retire from the other things you're doing if you want to. Yeah, some days it's fun, some days it's not. That's all right. An an honest opinion is exactly what I'm after. (laughs) I've been landlord at this point for about 40 years, which is a long, long time, and still get fooled occasionally. Um, I'm right in the middle Mm -hmm. here in Illinois. We've got crazy legislators who think we ought to be able to do our business without any of the protection and with them restricting income. Uh, They just, over the Memorial Day weekend in cloak of night, passed a state law where we um, can't screen for arrest records, juvenile records, or expunged records which unfortunately come up when you pull any criminal record. So we're scrambling to try to figure out how we deal with that in terms of getting at any criminal record. We've been told, get it off your application. And they've been trying to seal eviction records, so we can't pull for those either. So you can't tell if someone else, if a tenant's not paid another landlord, which would be a really clear indicator that you're probably going to have troubles with them paying too. Yeah, I've I've kind of figured that one out. I think if I ask the tenant to provide evidence of the last six rent payments, 
at least if they're currently in the mode of evict, 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 I won't uh, end up stuck with them. But it's still, it's an ever-changing business, as you know. I mean, real estate or strategies for buying properties or strategies for what to do with them or strategies for how to get rid of them or strategies for how to rent them. It changes almost daily, but certainly annually. And you got to be on top of it or you kind of get left in the dust. Tell me some basics about like someone that wants to become a landlord, wants to have more rental properties or already has a few rental properties or a lot and managing them. What what do you think they need to know? Taking your years of experience into account, what what does the landlord need to know? A vacancy is better than a bad tenant. That's the basics. Basically, with that in mind, getting things rented as quickly as possible so that you don't lose out on income that you could otherwise have is important. When If you haven't yet bought a place, I would recommend going everywhere from City Hall to find out what the local laws are. Go to the county, find out what the county laws are that affect landlords. Go to the state. Certainly go to your local real estate investor association and talk to other landlords for what places are good, what places aren't, because you're going to be dealing with everything from code enforcement when you're busy trying to rehab them between tenants. And by the way, I think some people go into rentals thinking they aren't going to have to do rehabs. Well, you have to do rehabs regularly as a rental property owner. What level of rehab? All levels of rehab. <laughs> it depends on how bad they mess the place up. What, what do you typically see, Jane? I don't know that there is any typical. The better you screen the tenants for everything from keeping up their households to uh, financial responsibility, evidence in their credit report and whatever, the more likely it is you get a a property back that you need to, I've had properties I've been able to turn over in 12 hours. That's been extremely unusual. Mm -hmm. And most of those have been military. I've got some rental property fairly near a military base and it's a military base that trains officers. So I end up with military officers occasionally in those properties. And they're very good for the most part. Respectful of the property and respectful of right. you as the landlord. I've read it to other people that you would guess would be respectable, like Boy Scout leader, fellow that the Boy Scouts hire to manage Boy Scouts in an area. Place was trashed. Mm-hmm. And I've kind of over the years tried to avoid doing a complete brand new counters, cabinets, everything else right before putting a tenant in. If I get to the point where I've rehabbed everything to the point of new, 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 I'm kind of inclined to sell the property. (laughs) For the most part, tenants, I would say the average tenant is nowhere near as respectful of your property as an owner would be. And you end up replacing things a lot more frequently than you would if it was your own house. The other thing, if you have a tenant that's not communicating and they aren't telling you when things are wrong, lots of people think that's wonderful. You know, I don't get the phone calls. <laughs> yeah, you need to get the phone calls because they somehow, some tenants somehow think you magically know something's wrong without them telling you. The house magically tells you the property just speaks to you <laughs> right. telepathically. You just get this feeling that, oh, geez, the roof's leaking over there. Yeah. It, that's not reality for me, at least. I don't have magical powers that I can tell what's wrong with the house. And so if you have a tenant that's not communicating, you need to possibly go over there yourself and do an inspection occasionally, possibly send a handyman over there, you know, maybe on a quarterly basis to do a run through of the house and fix anything that's wrong. But you need to do something and you need to convince the tenant that it's important to call you. Tenants that think their rent is too low tend to not want to call you because you might raise rent. I don't know where they get the ideas, but <laughs> maybe some landlords train them that way that you know people who make phone calls pay more rent. Uh, so they stay quiet and let problems fester. 
Right. I've got that with one of my vows, right? a water issue, and they, they just kind of told us about it you know, after the fact. So now we're, we're scrambling today trying to figure out how to fix it rather than to preemptively deal with it. Yeah, and drips under sinks are notorious. I mean, they they ignore them. Yeah. And so you get there and you go, well, geez, what happened to this cabinet? Or, you know, what happened to this floor? The other thing along those same lines is the screens. I mean, I personally, when you're replacing things in houses, I think if you're planning on renting the place, you need to be mindful of that. I have a house that somebody I have no idea who put in a screen door at some point that if your arms are full of groceries and you're trying to keep the screen door open as you're going through it, uh, your butt knocks the screen door, the screen out. Well, it's really poor design. And as a landlord, I should have looked at that and gone, that screen's never, you know, it's going to need to be replaced every week. This is ridiculous. <laughs> and when I put a screen door on my own house, I looked at them and I went, that's not going to work for that very reason. Well, I need to, you know, keep that in mind as I'm putting screen doors on tenants property too. The other thing is the cheapest materials are probably not the right choice either for things like faucets or light fixtures or whatever, because they are a little bit harder on them. So get, the solid things that hold up. So spending the extra five dollars now saves you from having to spend an extra hundred dollars in during an emergency repair. Yeah, and even if it's not an emergency, you're still paying somebody for labor, which ends up costing you know costing way too much. Um, I have another rental property that I actually bought new, and the builder or the plumber for the builder put in cheap plastic connectors which, you know, within about six months, one of them broke and flooded two units. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. And fortunately, we had a agreement with the builder that he would fix anything within 12 months of when we bought. And we said, this is unacceptable. Your plumber needs to go through and replace all of these. But people do that. I mean, if you aren't, if you don't have the right handyman, and you just kind of hire somebody and don't give them specific instructions, they tend to go for cheap. What have you done to find the right handyman to try to get to, let's talk about finding them and managing them or keeping an eye on them to make sure things are done the right way up to your standard. Finding them, you need to ask other people who they're using. If they will tell you, that's great. I have found that people at investor associations tend to be kind of tight-lipped about the ones that are good <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. I made the mistake early on of telling somebody about somebody that was good. And, you know, it was kind of like, okay, now he's not available when I need him. Yeah. I think when you find one that's good and I'm talking about somebody who's by what does good mean? Good means that they communicate well so that your tenant isn't sitting around waiting for somebody who doesn't show up. They have a wide range of skills they have their eyes open, so when they're there fixing one thing, if there are other things that need fixing, they notice them and have the skills to do them and also communicate to you that, oh, you know, I noticed this and I noticed this. Would you like me to fix them? Those three things are crucial for a good handyman, in my mind. So the communication stuff is key in this whole business. Finding them, I have found, is extremely difficult. I have also found that occasionally the ones that are have those three skills are kind of poor business people. And so you need to make sure that <laughs> you're taking care of them. I mean, if, they, if you haven't gotten an invoice and they've worked on stuff, push them to give you an invoice. Because if they aren't getting paid, just like the tenant who doesn't tell you about the, you know, the problem... Those guys will just think, well, geez, she should have known. Yeah, I've got a guy like that constantly. I, it's almost like I have to beg him to pay him. And it, it, I'm like, no, I, I want to pay you. I owe you. You and it, and it seems to have a problem sitting down and working up an invoice. So yeah. um, at a certain point, I go, you know, what, kind of on the spot, I'm like, what is this worth? So at least I have an idea. 
what the budget was. And then if I don't get an invoice from him, I'm saying, hey, look, I'm paying you. Tell me if this is correct or not. Yeah. And if they do great work and communicate, you know, you want to keep them. So you got to. Yeah, he's good people. I don't want to lose him. I want that's why I want him paid. Yeah. You need to go that other step or they'll go work for somebody else when they can. So they get paid. You know, I'm kind of a. Oh, I'm going to put in a toilet. I know that's a hundred bucks. Give me a hundred bucks or whatever. You know, those kinds of things are crucial. I personally have run through several that, you know, basically my business outlasted them. They passed away or they, I've had an excellent plumber retire. And many of them, the good handymen, the good, the good workers tend to know other good workers because when they do jobs where others are involved, they can see who's working and who isn't. And if they actually like you, they'll share those names with you. And the plumber that retired, he gave a, gave me the name of several other plumbers that he viewed as good plumbers. They were people that he would bring in to handle his customers when he went on vacation. I gotcha. And that helps a lot. The referrals from the tradesmen are probably even more valuable than referrals you'll get from. I've heard people say, go to the hardware store and get referrals. Well, the very first one of those I hired was a drunk that owed the hardware store a bunch of money. <laughs> hardware store just wanted him to have some money to get paid. <laughs> right. So no matter who it is, you need to do some screening on them. And I would suggest starting them on some small jobs and see if they're responsive, if they're timely, if they communicate, you know, if, making sure that they aren't padding their hours or whatever. And if they pass the muster on the small jobs, then you can turn them loose on a house. And my goal is to be able to give them a key and say, you know, go get that thing ready to rent. Get your trust level. Yeah, I need that trust level, and I need them at that point maybe to come back to me with a list, or I'm dealing with handyman long distance at this point, and basically they just take a ton of pictures and send them to me, and we discuss it, and they go for it, and then they send me a bunch of pictures when it's done, and an invoice. It requires trust on both ends there, there but until I run in, into problems with somebody, I tend to be trusting. Gotcha. So you're not physically seeing um, your properties each time, or you're not the one. Right. You're the owner, but you're not going to do the inspections yourself. Right. You know, locally I might, but typically I send someone. How wide-ranging are your rentals? Geographically, um, all Midwest, and price range, I've got everything from – Probably the cheapest things are just over a hundred thousand, and the most expensive are about maybe three fifty, four hundred. Okay. At this point, I I have had some lower income things, but I I can't put up with it. I'm not of the same mindset. I would rather be dealing dealing with people who have jobs and who have some potential at some point to become homeowners because they they seem like they kind of have a different mentality. And that said, you know, if I can find older people that are just tired of taking care of the place themselves, those sometimes are ideal because you get a long-term tenant that doesn't, has absolutely no interest in moving. I like that. And I tend to be pretty generous in terms of small rent raises instead of whatever the market bears, if I can have somebody that's long-term. Because your focus is on the stability of the unit and your overall cash flow right. and the minimization of headaches? Well, minimizing headaches, but the turnovers are they're very costly in terms of time, in terms of lost rent. I also hear people that say, okay, put an ad out there and you have it, you know, 20 people show up. Well, that doesn't typically happen for me. And part of it is I, I am in some communities that are mostly owner-occupied. And so the tenant pool is a little bit more limited. You know, if, if somebody's actually looking for a rental, they're probably in one of the neighboring communities. And when I first bought, I probably should have bought in those neighboring communities instead of the nice, you know, the high end one, a typical turnover will take, you know, can take a couple of months. And so if you have a 
turnover every year, you lose a couple months rent every year. That's ridiculous. And the turnovers between the the fix up and the rental, I mean, and then people tend to go looking for a place to rent. At least the ones that are going to end up being good and rent paying people tend to look several weeks or as much as a month or two ahead of when they want to rent. It can take some time to actually get them in there and start getting rent. And so it would be good if they stayed multiple years. What got you into uh, rentals, Jane? What were your goals at the beginning? Cash flow. Mm-hmm. When I first got into it, I was still a college professor. I actually still in my fairly early years as a college professor, as was my husband. And we looked into real estate as a side job, basically. I mean, we had summers off. We had, well, I say that we usually taught summer school for some added income, but usually had at least July and August off. And occasionally could end up with a a two-day-a-week teaching schedule, which allowed a lot of free time to do other stuff. After the first couple of years, first couple of years, you're working nonstop developing your courses. After that, you're teaching the courses, which doesn't take as much time. And if you aren't looking at the college professor job as long term, the research isn't as important, which takes the other time that college professors spend. So we started doing buy and rehab during that period of time and occasionally would keep something as a rental. The goal was to build a rental portfolio, but the thing that allowed us to keep things as rentals were when we got financing that could be long-term. Fairly early on, we had quit our jobs and became unfinanceable by banks. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. I mean, we didn't quit our jobs till we were making more on the side than we were on the job and the job was, you know, cutting into our time, but somehow the banks wanted the stability of the job. So seller financing type of things would allow us long-term financing. And when you're buying rehabs, at least at the time, this was back in the early eighties, they tended to be short-term loans. I mean, you'd get a year loan, six month loan or a year loan from a bank. If you were smart, you'd get the ability to extend it for another six months, but they were short-term high-priced loans, not something you would have on a rental. So those things we just tended to resell, but if we could find a seller that was motivated and not, but not motivated by need to have all cash, um, we could work out an arrangement where we were paying them by the month for long-term and that ended up being the beginnings of the of the rental portfolio were the long term holds that sellers had financed for us. Okay, so you put together a rental portfolio that let you replace both your jobs, both as as college professors, and because you were making more in real estate, just <laughs> which you were thrilled about, and the bank said, "Oh, well, now now you're risky." Yeah, well, and, and it, actually, some of the income that replaced the jobs was the. Uh, rehab projects too. I mean, it wasn't just yet. We hadn't hadn't followed Kiyosaki wasn't around yet in terms of his game. <laughs> <laughs> so we hadn't replaced the income with with steady cash flow at that point. And four years into being done with teaching, uh, my husband passed away, which kind of you know threw a wrench in things because at that point we were still working twelve hour days each. And one of the pieces of advice everybody gives you when you lose a spouse is don't make any changes for at least a year. Well, so guess how many hours I got to work? (laughs) (laughs) You you picked up both shifts. I picked up both shifts, yeah. You know, basically gradually eliminated the things that, that were not productive, or at least many of the things that weren't productive that I didn't actually love doing got eliminated. But we had such as well, such as I had a home inspection business that I was running uh, before he passed away, and that had been a booby prize from dealing with a con man. wasn't something we went out and started. We just he handed us the business as he left town with our money. (laughs) You you bought it, but unwillingly. (laughs) Yeah, and you know it was decent in that I had an an excellent inspector. 
and a couple other not so excellent inspectors that I got rid of and figured out how to make the thing work until the insurance rates on it went up to the point where they were unaffordable and home inspection businesses at the time there was no barrier to entry anybody with a pickup truck could claim they were an inspector like mm-hmm. they didn't even need a pickup truck they, you know <laughs> and it was new enough in the time frame when there really weren't a lot of inspectors out there that the business hadn't developed to the point where anybody was licensed people that were hiring inspectors really didn't know what to expect and we were doing it right in terms of having insurance, both for the workers as well as for the homeowner, that if somebody's up in your attic and falls through your ceiling and, you know, does a bunch of damage, we had the insurance to cover it. Unfortunately, many of the other people that were in the business didn't have insurance. And some of the people who were in the business were pretty lousy. And so the insurance company started getting worried about it. And when I quit the business, the insurance rates had for the upcoming year were more than my gross for the previous year. (laughs) I just said, you know, I can't be doing this. This is, you know, not so fun (laughs) to (laughs) to get to paid it. (laughs) Yeah. So you had to lean back on your, um, on your real estate holdings on, on still doing rehabs and the rental portfolio you were putting together. Yeah. Also, somewhere in that early stages, we started the Chicago Creative Investors Association, which is a for-profit real estate group. We're a chapter of National RIA. And also, somewhere in that, I guess it was early 90s, I started the Illinois Rental Property Owners Association, which is a group of groups from around the state specifically aimed at legislative things. So... I've spent a bunch of time doing that. I spent, my late husband had developed some courses and had been traveling and speaking when he passed away. And about a week before he passed away, we had a shipment of books dumped in the end of the driveway. So I had, you know, a thousand books in the basement, (laughs) you know, self-published that I needed to do something with. And probably about three weeks after he passed away, I got a phone call from the people who were running the Ohio Real Estate Investor Association saying, we had Mark booked for the convention in October, and we know you used to teach, you obviously can speak, and we know you do real estate, so would you mind coming and speaking? And that was the launch of my of my traveling and speaking, and at the peak, I was going out about twice a month doing it. Mm-hmm. And so it's the old strategy of multiple streams of income was happening with me. I mean, real estate is great and it's long term. I think the thing somebody ought to be thinking about retiring with, but keep in mind, I'm at the moment having to do a lot of juggling and shuffling because the state of Illinois has become inhospitable for landlords. So I'm trying to figure out where is better and, And what is better, because there are other types of real estate other than just, you know, being a landlord to to tenants, residential tenants anyway. So I'm, I'm kind of strategizing and working on, okay, what do I do instead? Diversification is extremely important to me. I mean, I've done a huge variety of different types of investing over the years, and some of it's more fun than others. So it's it's interesting times, and that's partly why why I'm still in real estate. I I probably have enough ADD that I can't stand doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And uh-huh. I learned while I was still in college to get engineering degrees. I had done some work study type of things at manufacturing plants, and I saw and also. I was at a company for a while that uh, designed aircraft instruments. And I looked at the people around me that were engineers and they were doing the same task every day. And I went, that would drive me insane. So that's when I went in (laughs) being a college professor, more in a business school setting. But once you've gone through the early stages in there, you're doing the same task every day and it drives you insane. (laughs) So 
one of the things I've loved about a real estate career is you can do different stuff every day. And you're going to do different stuff every day. Every house is different. Every property is different. Every tenant's different. Every worker's different. And yes, you can develop some systems, but there are going to be things that are different every time. And in addition to that, I've I think that's what has made me embrace the things like the home inspection business while I was doing it and the traveling and speaking business while I was doing it, and the running the group business while I was doing it. And I spent some, my late husband had a friend who was, who was, is still a professional gambler. And we did that for a while too, as a, you know, addition. And that, by the way, made more money than the college professor jobs too. (laughs) And I bet the banks didn't like that either. Well, they didn't look at it as stable income. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was set up with the current version at the time of a LLC and you know it was run very professionally but it was was still not <laughs> not income that the bank thought was stable. So you've done quite a few different things that uh yeah is, is stimulate it's different it's exciting to have something a little bit different every day and not Certainly doesn't feel real estate and these other businesses, but they, they, they certainly don't feel like a nine to five grind. Not at all. No. And I, and you would think, I mean, I, one of the reasons I think people quit nine to five jobs is that they think their time's going to be more free. I don't know that I've had more freedom. I've certainly had more flexibility. And then there's occasions where you don't have the flexibility you really want, which is, you know, frustrating when you're self-employed, but I've told people occasionally, I think other entrepreneurial types will agree with me that I'm my toughest boss I've ever had. <laughs> I'm in competition with myself is something I say all the time. Yep. You know, it's one of those things you've got to be self-motivated, self-driven, or you won't succeed in it. Yes. If your choice is to work on getting the property finished And by the way, that's another mistake I will say I've seen many, many landlords make over the years is just because they can do the work they do. And I'm talking about physical labor. Yeah. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. You've got to continuously be looking at what it is you're doing, what's the highest and best use of your time. If you can hire somebody else at a at a rate that's cheaper than what you would pay yourself, do it. And at least as far as I'm concerned, that was one of our biggest mistakes getting started. Both Mark and I had a lot of mechanical skills. I had grown up on a farm with a dad who was an engineer. He, The farm was his hobby farm. But by the time I w- you know, got out of the house at 18 to go to college, I had roofed roofs. I had done some drywall work. I'd done, you know, put up fencing. I had, you know, dad had tools from his uncle who had been a carpenter and all the stuff we ever used was hand tools. But I had done a massive amount of construction work as a kid. And Mark had all the plumbing and electrical skills you would ever want. He was a structural engineer so you know when we needed to design plans for doing some changes in the layout of a house I had done drafting as a student at uh, Cornell and so we would just draft up our own plans and take them over to the city and at the time they didn't go you don't have a architect here because he had a structural engineering degree it was fine with them we would take the next step and start installing stuff ourselves or painting or whatever. And we were not fast at that stuff. And if you start looking at what your holding cost is for one day and you take one day longer than the other guy or one week longer than the guy that you could hire to do the job, you can start seeing that you could pay them just out of the holding costs that you're wasting. Uh, It's not actually any cheaper. No, it's not any cheaper to do it yourself. And you're spending time doing something that doesn't allow you to find the next deal to, you know, even go fish if you wanted to. 
Jane, that's a, that's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow, though, because you feel like if you do it yourself, you're not paying anyone, and therefore you're saving money. What you're saying is it, there's, there's a hidden cost. There's that holding cost that's going to get you if it takes you longer. Or even if you do something well and do it efficiently, you still, if your value is really somewhere else, bringing in deals or negotiating with, with, with sellers and, and running your business, that's a higher value. If it's cheaper to pay somebody else, you got to pay somebody else. It, it, it actually is cheaper to pay the money to that person rather than do it yourself and effectively be losing your potential. Yeah, I I think when we we discovered that when all of our tools got wiped out by a flood, and as we went to start to buy new tools, I said, you know, Mark, let's look at this. I made up scenarios of us doing something, handyman doing something, and hiring the professional painters that had a crew that would get it done in a day. And the thing that won out every single time was the professional painters that would get the job done in a day or two days. Hmm. That doesn't mean I don't utilize handymen regularly. I utilize handymen because yeah. when I get a house that has a huge variety of things that need doing, I need somebody that can do all of those things. I would prefer the handyman that was willing to call in the teams of people to do various things and just coordinate the job. You know, be a general contractor as well as handyman to you know fill in the gaps. That's ideal, and I've had that kind of person, and you know that's amazing when you can get that kind of person. Doing it ourselves, that was the day we quit. You know, it was like, okay, we just did the math. This doesn't make any sense. It was almost a blessing in disguise having your tools get stolen. Or, sorry, lo- losing them to a flood. Yeah, it was a blessing in disguise. You know, I, I still say if you, want to, if you enjoy doing that kind of stuff and you want to do it, do it on your own house. <laughs> <laughs> as your enjoyment time, or if you don't want to live in a construction project, then do it on occupied rentals. But don't let the holding cost eat up the, you know, the value of having done something yourself. Yeah, because it can eat up profits for years to come if if you don't do it right. Right, and I realize. I mean, some people don't like living in construction projects. I or their spouse doesn't, or their, <laughs> you know, it's not <laughs> for their kids or whatever. So I get it, you know, don't do that to them because that's one of the other things that I have seen over the years has been a, many marriages have been a victim or have been destroyed in the process of owning rental property. How so? Well, early on when we started the Chicago Creative Investors Association, I kind of noticed that a lot of people were getting divorced and this was now, just in general, a lot of people get divorced, but at the time, <laughs> at the time, not so much. And when you started looking, the people were not, the people you were talking to, they were basically having their spouse home doing all of the bookkeeping and the tenant management and that kind of stuff. And they were out doing what I would consider the fun part of real estate, which is the deal making. But the grunge work was put on their spouse. Many of them were too cheap to have their spouse as a member of our group. And so their spouse was never getting to hear about the business as a whole and was also not getting to get the benefit of the trainings we were putting on that would have helped them. And so we early on said, okay, your spouse or partner is automatically a member for no additional fee. I mean, we first said spouse, and then people talked us into partner. And the problem with that was they didn't, still didn't bring their spouse. Well, your spouse can't be, have all the stuff dumped on them that makes them a low-level employee. That's just not fair. You can hire bookkeepers. You can hire property managers if, if you need to, or even if you want to. I mean, allow your spouse to share some of the fun of the business as well, looking for property using their design sense to figure out what you ought to do with something once you've bought it, you know, even staging property. And I'm, I say that as a general, I mean, some people actually like dealing with tenants. I have no idea how or why that happened, <laughs> <laughs> but it does. <laughs> and some people like bookkeeping. If you like it, fine, do it. You know, as long as it's your favorite thing to do or you can't tire anybody that 
you know, cheap enough to be cheaper than your labor time would be. Gotcha. And there are other people, I think nobody else will do it as well as I can. That is the kiss of death for growth. And it's something that you also get out of the people that are trying to do all the work on the property themselves is, you know, nobody else is going to do it as well. Or I need to be, you know, pick the paint color exactly. (laughs) Who cares? (laughs) You know, other people have a mind too, as long as they're not doing something ridiculous, let it go. You've got better things to worry about. That's a tough one. It's hard. It's hard to let go of a lot of that little um, micromanagement obsession. You know, people think it's if oh if if I'm not quarterbacking this and general manager and team owner and every position on the field, it's not going to get done right. I, I think you have to accept that good is good enough. Yeah, I think good is good enough. I, and I think one of the things that I've I've seen over the years, some people have suggested, and I would buy into it. The thing I mentioned paint color before, I'm going to back up on that a little bit. Paint color, if you can standardize it in your properties, it's a good idea because then when you've got to fix, you know, paint, paint where somebody's dinged the wall or whatever, it's not like you're searching for what the heck did we use here. Um, and by the way, there are ways of dealing with that too. I've got a friend who's got a little three ring. A notebook that he basically gets an extra sticker from the paint cans, glues it in there, and writes what room it is in what property. Not perfect. And you can do that electronically pretty easily too, but it's easier to just have standardized paint. But when you're dealing with handymen and uh, painting contractors and whatever, you know, some of that stuff, you can overthink it, you can over over involve yourself and once again you're wasting time theirs and yours <laughs> don't overthink and don't over involve yourself right jen what was it like you had to basically take over both sides of your business when your husband passed away and, and what was it like uh, staying focused and having to run that you know as, as a single woman Why, what did that what did that take um well one of the toughest parts was that the bank that we had finally convinced we were lendable suddenly decided we weren't. <laughs> we weren't because it was just me. There were some good things and some bad things about it. it. It basically, I think, helped me through some of the grief. And the grief is something that I've, I've read some things lately, and I would totally agree. It never really goes away totally. You just learn ways of coping in the tough times. One of the things that I found the hardest to do was Mark had been writing a monthly newsletter. So we had subscribers to a monthly newsletter. And I had convinced myself early on in my engineering career, actually in college and in grad school, I had convinced myself I couldn't write. So here I was faced with coming out with eight pages a month. I knew the business well enough I could do that part. How do I write? And basically, I sat down at the computer and I started writing newsletters. And the choice was quit the speaking business, quit the teaching, which I enjoyed parts of that too. And I just made up my mind that everybody says, don't don't change anything. I guess I need to write a newsletter. So I, I'll give it a shot. And it turns out, I think with some guidance from above, both from Mark as well as because a year into it, somebody said, Mark really had a lot of articles at the can. (laughs) And I went, no, he had one newsletter done except the back page. So I wrote an obituary on the back page of that one newsletter. That was it. And ever since then, it's been me. I went, seriously? Because somehow the writing style came out very similar. And I guess in some ways we were both engineering and, you know, math people. So, and I was trying to write for the same audience that he had been writing for. So that happened. As far as running the real estate stuff, I had been handling the day in and day out stuff for a lot of that and the dealing with the contractors. I had not been dealing with the banker. And that was a problem because a problem that developed because the person who had referred us to the banker said the guy was sexist. The you know, wouldn't deal with women. So, okay. 
one of the things I learned is you don't have one banker, you have several bankers. Banks change their mind on what their lending policies are. At that point, I basically dealt with the one property he had under contract at the time that needed closing because the people were getting divorced, going bankrupt, and losing it in foreclosure. I needed to get that thing closed within a couple of weeks of them dying. And the banker said, you know, who had already approved the loan said, nope, we aren't going to do it. I brought on a partner that could sign on the loan. That was their sole role. I gave them 50% of the deal so I wouldn't have to renege on the seller and got the thing done. That was hard, but it gets easier. And as I said, you just, you start looking at the pile of things that need doing and you start weeding through what's really important. What's the best use of my time? Which of these plates can I, I occasionally would look at it as I was, you know, had nine plates spinning in the air and I can't focus my energy on every one of them, which ones are the critical and crucial ones. And if some of the others eventually fall off, so be it. It's getting prioritized uh, correctly. And when you're, when you're forced to do it, you do. You say, you know, these, these couple spinning plates don't matter. Let them fall. I'm going to focus on these good ones over here. Right. And, uh, you know, most of the things in this business, if we do need to change, you know, society changes, the rules change, the game changes, the economy changes, lending changes, all of those things make us have to change. And I think the more avenues you have where you can grow, succeed, you know, produce income, the better off you are. I mean, I occasionally look around and I go, okay, if this doesn't work, you know, if what I'm doing right now stops working, what are my other choices? And for focus, I mean, I, I have a lot of things going on at the moment. And if I just shift focus, I can ramp the income from a different thing up a lot more than it is. And, you know, the one that's the things that are currently providing income can back off if they're no longer as profitable as they had been. For me, that's what makes this business fun is the the variety. So you'll adapt to you'll adapt to what you need to. You'll change what needs to be changed, adapt to what needs adapting to that way you can keep having fun and variety and and keep the income coming in. Yeah, you have to. I mean, I when I started in the business, we had interest rates that were you know, 18% was a typical home loan. So you did something different than go to the bank and borrow 18% money to buy houses. You talked to sellers who were happy with 14% or 10% or whatever. And, you know, as time changed, we've been through a series of years here where you could get extremely cheap interest. So you borrow from banks if possible. That's something that I... Unfortunately, I see people that are getting into the business get so laser focused on one thing that they are going to have a hard time adapting as things shift. I saw a huge fallout back with the savings and loan crisis of people that were unable to adapt to, to the changes that had to be made. So I've seen huge fall off on even some of the minor crises, but in the 2007 and eight. And I would say through at least 2010, there was a lot of fallout from people, you know, towards the end of it were people that actually had had enough resources to survive for a while, but they still didn't change. You need to be able to change or you aren't going to survive long term. I view one of the biggest things that's forcing change at the moment is legislative. And that is something that unfortunately we have at least here in Illinois and in several other states for certain, we have legislators who, who have victim written, you know, they see people with victim written on them and they decide that they need to take from people who know how to produce and give to the victim. <laughs> Jane, I want, I want to talk about the, um, bad laws coming because you're in Illinois. Um, there's certainly no lack of bad laws and legislation in Illinois, but it's spreading. It's like a plague that spreads from state to state. And 
I think um, many of these, you know, the state legislators go to conferences and they go, hey, whoa, ooh, that's a good law. And it's so easy to copy paste the law of one state into another. And next thing you know, we, we can be overwhelmed by nonsense really quickly. I mean, what's the most kind of egregious or awful thing that's uh, that's been in Illinois that might spread elsewhere? There are two things that I think, and you said one, but I'm picking two. Sure. I think the things that are going to limit our screening are the most egregious I see. One of them is sealing eviction records. There was a book, it was named, I think it was called Evicted or something, that got a whole bunch of people's attention. And a study that went with it that came out of De, uh, DePaul University that was talking about some huge num- percentage of evictions are not for cause, is what the study was claiming. I used to teach statistics. It was bullshit. Pardon my French. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't bother to look at what the other causes of an eviction being dropped are, other than that it wasn't filed for cause. And they acted as if the only things that were filed for cause were the ones that went all the way to the person actually getting a judgment against the tenant. Well, there's a million reasons evictions disappear before they get to that stage, all of them preferable to getting to that stage. And this university student, professor, whoever the heck it was, didn't look at any of them. They had one thing that might be a possibility, and that was that the landlord was being a greedy bastard. Because of that study, there have been there's been a lot of push to seal eviction records. I think that is egregious. I think it's spreading because other places are going, oh my, wow, people are, you know, filing evictions against the poorest tenants. Well, nobody files an eviction unless they aren't getting paid or the tenant, <laughs> you know, the tenant's doing something that's getting them calls continuously from the police or the neighbors or whatever. You know, you don't file evictions just for fun ever. They're costly. They're you know, heart wrenching in many cases, and it would be much better if the tenant just paid or if the community stepped forward and took care of the person's problem. We do because we have to. We have to have income or we can't pay the bills. So that's the big one. The other one that has come, I think, out of it's been labeled disparate impact, and it's the um, criminal background stuff. I think. They have just passed a ordinance in the in Cook County, which is where Chicago is, called the Just Housing Ordinance. And basically, what it's saying is that you can't screen for criminal background until after you've approved the tenant on all other grounds. At that point, you can do a criminal background check and discuss with the tenant and make a decision based on a discussion, but you can't have any blanket, I don't take felons, you know, convicted felon, <laughs> no. or I don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sex offenders, they tend to set aside as we can say we don't take sex offenders, but what they're really looking for is us to help bring people that have come out of prison back into society by not making it so difficult for them to find housing. But it can't be our choice as landlords. I mean, that's, you You can argue that's a good thing. On the other hand, it, you can also argue you, you're maybe not the one that has to be bearing the brunt of, of doing that. I think in the past, public housing used to bear the brunt of that, or families used to bear the brunt of that as their loved ones came out of jail. And over time, they would you know, get to the point where they could get in into normal housing on their own if they didn't, if they weren't repeat offenders. And at least the company Rent Perfect that I've been doing a bunch of screenings through, they look at seven years history on criminal behavior, which is probably good enough. If somebody's been clean and not not jailed for seven years, probably they've got less of a chance of recidivism or well, how you pronounce that word um, than somebody that, you know, it's only two years out of jail. 
I've actually had somebody marry someone that was in jail and when they came into my and then brought them home to my voucher I had a section 8 property actually not a housing voucher but prior to that a section 8 property they brought their new husband home to my house he had apparently been a drug offender and he started his drug operation in my suburban house <laughs> I got it back about a year later with a bullet hole in it in windows where in an area that was, I mean, everybody thinks of this area here as where bullets flying everywhere. For the most part, no, <laughs> there are certain, certain areas you don't want to go into because you might get shot at random bullets, but this was a nice suburban house and it had a bullet hole in, in windows. It had every door had been bashed in by somebody's shoulder because of, you know, violent behavior, holes cut in floors to stash drugs under them. The cabinets in the kitchen had been, they were brand new when the tenant had moved in and they had been totally destroyed. I mean, the, it was a massive rehab project to put the place back in the condition for new people on the order of about 50000 bucks back in the early 90s. So a lot of money spent that I had to spend. I've had a little bit of experience with somebody coming out of jail into my rental property. Not that I wanted them there and not that I, right. you know, really had choices. I guess I could have started an eviction, but. Well, so what do we do as real estate investors, as landlords, as property owners? How do we, how do we fight this um, trend that's occurring at the state level? We band together in a way that landlords are not typically <laughs> willing to do. I've been the leaders that are on the political action committee, as well as on the board of Illinois rental property owners have frequently called it like herding cats, trying to get people to band together to do anything, getting them to pay to do anything is even more of a difficulty, but we need to make our legislators aware of the downsides of what they're doing. We need to fight it off everywhere it's happening, not just where we've already established groups like mine that are fighting it off here. If you're in an area where nobody's doing anything, do something, because you will find that legislators, they listen to people and they listen to the squeakiest wheel. And if somebody comes in claiming they have a problem and you're the victim of their change, Unless you're saying something, they do what the squeaky wheel's asking them to do. And they need to hear both sides. I mean, we did, this year, we again successfully fought off rent control here. Last year, we managed to. This year, we have. It's going to keep coming back to the legislature. But we have banded together with the realtors. We've banded together with the large apartment owners, um, manufactured housing, because they were going after them, too. You know, basically, the people that were going to end up having to deal with rent control got organized in a way that we haven't ever been before. And as such, I think it's offering us opportunity to start fighting off some of these other things that are minor for one group, but major for another. And also, we're, we've developed the mechanism for getting the grassroots stuff going as well as the, you know, discussions with legislators, in-depth discussions with legislators. We've gotten ourselves a seat at the table, which is something that is very important, that if they're thinking about proposing a bill that's going to affect you, you need to get the phone call from them saying, okay, what do you think about this? Is there anything we can do differently? That we don't get blindsided. Yeah, because I, I mean, after when they came out with the rent control proposals last year, I started thinking to myself, okay, they're, they claim they want more affordable housing. Now, you got to keep in mind what they claim they want and what they actually are trying to do aren't necessarily the same thing. <laughs> but I figured I would focus my attention on what they claimed they wanted, and I started a list of other ways of providing more affordable housing. And by the time I was done with my list, I had 91 ways. And I'm sure there are probably another thousand ways that I just, that just 
didn't come out of my head would come out of somebody else's if they worked at it. And they're everything from making, well, making things more affordable for builders by cutting down on some of the just nightmare of approval process. I'm not going to go into the 91 ways, but there are 91 ways. And we, we started <laughs> fitting that to the legislators who were insistent on rent control as the only answer for more affordable housing. And here were 91 other ways, other answers. Right. And here were all the economists who for years have said rent control doesn't do this. As well as Forbes, I produced the Forbes magazine in the um, end of 1999, they put out an issue that were the dumbest ideas of the 20th century, and rent control was number two on the list. And, <laughs> you know, you start, totally agree. you lay those kinds of things out in front of the legislators, you give them some other solutions. Because I think that's one of the big problems is everybody says, no, 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 but they don't say, you've got a problem, do this instead. So if you start thinking with a solutions oriented, approach to these things, you're more likely to get the seat at the table. You're more likely to come up with some other answer than what it is they're trying to do. Or they're, you know, the solution, the quote unquote solution they've come up with. So that's another interesting challenge. And it's, I guess for me, early on, I got hit by a, uh, I had some raw land and I, a community that put in an impact fee that charged ten thousand dollars per lot for um, anybody who was going to put in housing on that raw land, and I looked at it as okay. I just got at ten thousand a piece. That's ten thousand less that a builder or a developer would pay me for that land for each lot. So I just got hit for a hundred thousand bucks in a community I've been paying taxes for years. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. And more ridiculous is this was up in Wisconsin. I'm living down here. I drove two and a half hours to the to the city hall meeting on this subject. There was not a single property owner from that area or actually any other property owner that said said boo about it. And the city council, as they recognized me, they said, Jane, we know you don't live here. We'll let you speak anyway. This was a city council that I happened to be very instrumental in getting them in place, so they knew me. And we'd had enough, we'd had a run in with the previous city council and got them all thrown out out of office and helped these guys get in. And they listened to me, but they didn't. But they voted the way they felt was appropriate, which was anybody building this stuff needs to, you know, pay for road, pay for more roads and more sewer and more water and you know everything. That we've already paid for yeah line to the impact that it was having on uh, not being able to improve that community or put up housing yeah so that that was early on in my investing career that that happened and i just said you know i need to pay attention i need to get more active in and i need to get other people more active because this this can be really damaging to your portfolio in your your bottom line, you know, if nobody says anything, and if I'd been talking to these guys early on about it, rather than just, you know, three minutes at a city council meeting, I might have been able to talk some sense into them. So meanwhile, eternal vigilance is what we have to do to make sure our businesses don't get squished out by bad laws. Yep. I think eternal vigilance, as well as your escape route, what else are you going to do? Yeah, if everything goes bad, what else can I do? Well, thinking of that, Jane, what, um, looking back over all your landloading experience over the years, what, what do you wish, that knowing what you know now about rentals, what would you have done differently? Tom, that's very, very hard to answer because times change. I think the things I did that I would have done differently at the time, one of them is, is more market evaluation before I bought a property. I mean, some of my early properties I bought, I spent more money on them than I should have. If I'd looked around for in communities 
at the time, research was nowhere near as easy as it is today, but you need to look at what rentals are versus what purchase price is. And if this is particularly with single family home rentals, I bought in a community where I probably paid twice as much as the neighboring community for a house. And I was able to rent it for maybe 20% more than I would have been able to rent the same house, you know, the one in the neighboring community. So that cut into cash flow pretty drastically. Is the neighbor neighboring community is great for resale? At the time, I would have said no, but it has shifted. It's a community that that people have decided they like a lot. So the they've probably had more appreciation over the last ten years than the community that I, that I had the higher priced houses in. And I think part of it is the lower priced houses aren't don't have the same tax bill. So owner occupants decided they didn't want to spend as much taxes and they went there. The markets shift and I think you need to continue to pay attention to them. But I think buying things and looking at the cash flow on the front end is extremely important. At the, that point in time, I had not adequately done my research in terms of looking at where the best long-term return would be. And it's hard to do because who knows what's happening long term. But in general, you'd spend spend a little more time, a little more focus on uh, evaluating and really making sure the cash flow up front is where it needs to be to make it a good deal. Right. Okay. And then deal with the futures comes. Awesome. Jane Garvey, thank you. Fantastic. Well, you're certainly welcome, Tom. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. Your next step is to visit GetTractionPodcast.com. There you'll find all current episodes and a link to download a free copy of Tom's Deal Flow Cheat Sheet. Happy wholesaling. 